now we will continue and we will go in depth in uh, how to <laughs> handle frequency stability in the Nordic power system. And I will very much welcome my colleague, uh, Andreas Westberg, who will guide you through this. Uh, please, Andreas, introduce yourself and uh, enjoy your 40 minutes. <laughs> 40 mi yep. Andreas Westberg, Svenska Kraftnet. I've been working at Svenska Kraftnet since March 2012. I started in operations, did my master thesis within frequency stability, and then, whoops, they wanted me to work with frequency stability, and I've done that since basically the fall of 2012 on a Nordic level for half time and in operations for the other half time, roughly. I've been working as, or I did work as a grid supervisor for Sansi Kraftnet for three and a half years with basically the responsibility for the operational security 24 seven every six week when I was in the control center. So I'm just gonna check if this one works. Yep. Quick question to you guys, since I don't know you. How many of you are engineers and how many of you are economics? <laughs> engineers, hands up. How many has an economist background? One. S something, yeah. Kind of both. Who work, does anyone work partly with market side economics? One, two. Jonas, did I see your hand? Yep. So we've got mostly engineers. Has anybody of you studied control theory? Yeah, good. So what I'll be speaking about is essentially frequency stability. I work on a system level. We're responsible for the entire system. But we need to describe it to you from the product side. You're not responsible for the system, you're responsible for your power plant, for your delivery. That means you go from input to output, and that's the product. So we need to be able to describe the product catalog. The products that we have at the moment are FCR. We've got two products, and one probably that's coming, FFR. It's called Fast Frequency Reserve. It's a short boost, essentially. Five, 10 seconds, up, then down. What are they and how will they be designed, changed, and implemented? So the purpose of why I'm here today is to hopefully inform you to you why we must perform this change, essentially. If I can get that message across to you and you accept that and understand that, then we'll have come extremely far. I've got 40 minutes, they say. And hopefully I can catch your interest in starting to deliver these type of resources. Because um, as I understood, Forsmark, Oskarsam and Ringhals are here today. Is that correct? Yes, some people are nodding. <laughs> Good. Uh, and why? Well, the business case is roughly half a billion to one billion per year in what we're procuring. And we're buying roughly 250 megawatts of FCRN, which uh, has the best price per megawatt. And then we're buying roughly 450 megawatts of FCRD just nationally in Sweden. FFR on a Nordic level will come in around zero megawatts during the peak load hour when the system is as heaviest and maybe two, three, four hundred megawatts during the extremely light system events if our largest nuclear units are in op operation. Uh, I'm going to try to describe the connection from the system level down to you as a component level just by describi describing what's the system design to the product catalog. How do we get that connection so that you understand your place in the system with regards to frequency stability? So we've got frequency stability, technical requirements, next steps, recap. Frequency stability. I think that Maya has shown that little graph. Is that true? Yeah. Good. 
What I'll be speaking about is the little top left corner. And then just those two, essentially. So it's a small part of the entire system, but it's an essential part. Frequency stability. What is it? Well, to maintain frequency stability, a simple model of it from a technical perspective can be to say that to ensure frequency stability, you need the reserves, you need F FCR. You need some type of system inertia, be it mechanical, electrical, synthetic, whatever, inertia. And then you've also got the actual disturbances that will affect the overall frequency stability. Without any disturbances, you don't have a problem. Then the system will just be status quo, it will just limp on. Nothing will happen. Well, you sh we've started to define frequency stability using the words transient frequency stability and small signals frequency stability. And the differences can be shown in this graph, which is a real event from November 2011, just past midnight, when a large unit tripped, the frequency dropped from 50 hertz down to 49.35, then rebounded. That's the transient event. We have an overshoot or an undershoot in the system. And the reason for it is that we've got a hydro-based system, which has non-minimum phase systems, delays, etc. The transient part of the system, the transient frequency stability, is to ensure that that little undershoot does not go below 49 hertz. Because at 48.8 hertz, we start decoupling Stockholm, Malmö, Göteborg, just to save the system. But when the system has rebounded, and you've also got it before the actual disturbance, you've still got all of us in the power system, we continuously switch on and switch off our lamps, lights, train start, stop, etc. Th there is an ambient noise in the system. So the system will continue to wiggle. And that's a sort of small signal stability issue. But it's a non-linear small signal stability issue. Thereby, we've started defining in, uh, the transient and small signal part. Now, the FCRN is responsible for the small signal stability within the normal band of operation, 49.9 to 50.1 hertz. FCRD, which is the disturbance reserve, is responsible for the transient event, but also the small signal stability outside or underneath 49.9 down to 49.0. The system needs both. You can't just have either or. After the disturbance, we've also got balancing reserves, which will restore the system towards 50 hertz. That's one of the main issues with balancing. And I don't know, uh, how many of you have heard of the Nordic balancing concept? Some of you, yeah. Essentially, we've developed, Sanskaftnet, together with our Nordic counterparts, have developed a, a version 2.0 of how our balancing philosophy and how we wish to do that. It's very similar to classical ACE systems. But essentially, frequency stability is then the sum of system inertia reserves and disturbances and how they all interact. Any questions? Just pop your hand up. So, why I was asking you about control theory. Closed loop stability. Today's requirement, I would say, are fairly easy and brackets. We essentially require that for FCRN and FCRD, you perform a step response with a certain time constant. That's equivalent to saying that, yes, please stand on your one, please stand on one leg. Um, however, to maintain and ensure operational security, you also need closed-loop stability from a system perspective. For, and that's where control theory comes in. 
closed loop stability essentially means that you are to be able to stand on one leg but on a balancing plate. That's the best metaphor that I can come up with on what closed loop stability actually means at the moment. We've had it fairly simple historically that the system inertia, kind of the width of that balancing plate at the bottom, has been pretty wide. So we haven't really had a problem with closed loop stability. The fact that when you measure frequency, you, you affect the system. And that interaction can cause instability in itself, even though that when you just measure open loop systems, you might be stable. So an open loop system that is that you then close the loop in might destabilize the, the system. And what we're seeing at the moment is that the system inertia will become lower during low load situations. It will become lower during high load situations sometimes due to that we have, for example, a lot of wind power coming into the system. I've seen scenarios for 2030, 2040 where the inertia level can be as low during high load systems as it is during today's low load systems, just because half the system might be dependent on wind power. And this is what we're trying to accomplish essentially in a lot of the new requirements that we're developing. We've foreseen that, yes, we need to set a requirement on closed loop stability, but Testing closed loop stability isn't easy. Well, that one's on wrong, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a check, it's launch time. Um, so we've had to develop m ways to actually test closed loop stability. And they will be in, in the requirements and it will essentially be requiring that you maintain a certain level of phase margin and amplitude margin, but that you can show with physical pre-qualified tests out in the unit from input signal to output signal. But why? Well, just to explain why the system, again, is changing, I've got a, I um, just want to, it's a rough historical back uh, outlook. Back in the days, when a lot of nuclear units were being built, we had, for the normal operational, kind of the small signal stability issue, we had a value of 6,000 megawatt per hertz as the steady state gain for FCR and a 60 second time constant. Those of you who are delivering FCR resources today might know that that's the same data and values that we have today. So the system really the resources haven't changed, but the system has changed. For disturbances, there was an operational instruction called PD079, which stated that FCR D, momentary disturbance reserve, has to have a full activation time of 30 seconds, not to 100% in 30 seconds. That's essentially the old UCTE standard, the continental standard which is now also enshrined in the ENSOE guideline for system operations. So they still have that same requirement. But the continental European system has an inertia that is five to ten times greater than the Nordic system, which ensures essentially frequency stability because they, it's heavy. It doesn't move. Then sometimes during the 80s, something called EP3 disturbed was developed an operational mode for turbine governors. It had a five second time constant, but it also had a 30 second blockage after it was activated. And the reason for that, if we've understood everything correctly, because I'm, there's a lot of old Vattenfall people here, that was essentially Stortia Vattenfallsverket who developed it. It was blocked because it had small system stability margin. And it was also developed, the input assumptions for developing that EP3 disturbed was that a lot of units would be running. The system would be heavy. It would be a high loads case because 
nuclear units weren't supposed to operate during low load situations. But that was back in the 80s. Things have changed. Then, during deregulation, that was essentially reformed into a Nordic requirement, but instead of a five second requirement with 30 second blockage, a requirement came in that stated that you need to have delivered 50% within five seconds and 100% within 30 seconds. The interpretation was still then that the 100% delivery within 30 seconds would be the steady state activation level of a step response test. Then things changed a little bit, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But essentially, we still have that requirement for FCRD today. But the system has changed and nuclear units are running during Midsummer's Eve when the system uh, is at its lightest point. So the system has changed. We need to review the design accordingly. But there are so many other factors that help us at the moment with frequency stability. So it's not really a, it's not a critical system issue at the moment. But this is the thing that is the main source for stabilizing the system. So essentially, the total technical needs are larger than the actual technical requirement. We're expanding the technical requirements. What we're essentially discussing, or what I'm discussing and trying to make a point of, is that the new requirements under development that you can find under this link, and the new product that's under development, which Statnet ran a pilot on that link, is what we tried to describe or start to describe within our Sansi Kraftnet uh, system development plan. Table 8, these product categories. And a lot of it, they're coming from that. Maya's graph again. The electricity market has shifted outside the physical boundaries of the system. We need to act, we need to ensure that everything matches. So we're expanding the technical requirements to match the actual system needs. And hopefully you'll be able to deliver. Or well, that's what I'm hoping. What we're doing at the moment is we're planning for a feasibility study on how to implement these new technical requirements. Present day, feasibility. And why we're doing this instead of just implementing them straight off the bat is that these technical requirements do require a heck of a lot of more testing. Essentially, in order to test the I'm standing on one leg to ensure stability requirement. What we've needed to develop is a method on how do you actually test closed loop stability. What we've done there is to look back at control theory to sign in, sign out testing. A linear system, if you send in a sine wave to a linear system, you'll get a sine wave out. But that has a different amplification and a different phase shift. Now combine that data that you get from such a test with the knowledge that you have nonlinear systems, but it's kind of a linearization of that point in itself. Combine that with a model of the system inertia and the system load frequency dependency, then we can develop a model of the system reserves and the system inertia. Close that loop and we can start testing if it's stable, if it's not, and if it meets the essentially the pre-qualified and the defined requirements that we've set. But testing this isn't the easiest thing because we've also noticed that going out and testing, yes, you've got a turbine governor somewhere. Something controls the speed of the turbine. If it's a waterway or if it's a hydropower plant or if it's a steam turbine, there should be a turbine governor somewhere. But that turbine governor gets fed with a signal that's measured on the grid bus bar, or on the generator bus bar. 
And that measurement system is also needs to be included. So essentially, you need to add the sign-in signal as far up the measurement chain and as close to the generator bus bar as possible. Because what we're buying is essentially bus bar to bus bar reserves, input to output. I don't really care on how you deliver it in the end, as long as you can show me input to output relation that fulfills the requirement. But being able to feed in with a signal generator before the actual measurement equipment is proving tricky. Thereby, we need to have a plan for how do we implement this in a feasible manner? How do we get a realistic plan for implementation? So that we can ensure that once we set out these new requirements, we have a sound transition period where people learn, where you as market actors learn on how to do this, where we learn on the actual results that we get back, because sure, we've developed requirements, but I mean, we sit in an office, we don't sit at the power plant, so we don't have actual knowledge of power plant behavior. We've got models. We need to update our knowledge as well on how this works in practice. So it's a give and take. But to be able to run this, uh, we're project planning at the moment. Hopefully execution will start after summer. Uh, we're setting up reference groups, one per each country, for a national reference group, where we want you to participate if you are interested. Uh, and the essential mean of that reference group is to help to develop a realistic plan for implementation. How do we develop a realistic transition fix on how we implement this stuff? And if you're interested in participating, then you can send a mail to either Mal Investor, who's the project manager, or Therese Falberg at Svenska Kraftnet, who's in the steering committee. Um, and then formal invitations will go out through Drift Planerings and Elmarknadsrådet later once the project plan, etc., is finalized and we know more exact details. Uh, when will you publish the new requirements? So <laughs> <laughs> Lynn Sarnan was in the old frequency project and she's been screening us a heck of a lot and yes, she's interested. That's good. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, I'm essentially preparing to publish the report on our external web. It'll hopefully be out uh, within a week or two or something like that. But the problem was that with the FCRD requirements, we were hoping to review to get to actually a new set of this as the requirement. For the FCRN, where Lynn participated in the reference group and Evert was a project manager. I don't know if there was anybody else who was actually in the reference group there. I don't think so. Um, uh, within this group then. We went through four iterations just to develop the FCRN requirements. And there's still a little bit of tweaking that we've heard of that's needed because we've got feedback since we delivered back in the summer of 2017. For FCRD, however, there is a problem that we can't just reach. We can come up with a set of technical solutions that will work. But then the markets won't work. FCRD is a market-based product. But. Either the system can be developed so that it's developed for Norway, or the, it, if it's developed and set the requirements so that the FCRD requirements handles all hours of the year, then we have to def base the design requirement on the minimum system inertia. Then the only units that can develop are essentially the fastest Norwegian Pelton turbines. And I would be guessing that you as nuclear units could develop as well, or could deliver as well, but you're not in the current market. So that's a high risk on developing something that's just for you and you're not in. I mean, that's a transition period as well. On the other hand, if we want a broader base to be able to participate, the entire hy hydro fleet, in the, uh, in the Nordic system, 
then the inertia kind of swings to the other level instead. Kaplan units are slower. They've got longer water time constants. They've got more me mechanical equipment that needs to adjust in the runner. Then the system inertia that can be handled swings to kind of the other far extreme, the heaviest side. If that is the case, that the FCRD will be designed for the heaviest system load again, just as it was for EP3 Disturb back in the days, then we need the FFR there every hour of the year. But the volume of FFR that will be needed will be inversely proportional to the system inertia level. So more inertia, less is FFR, less inertia, more FFR. So we need in this feasibility study to understand which design light system, heavy system. A lot of FFR, not so much FFR. Some requirements on FCRD, some other requirements on FCRD. What is the most feasible way of implementing it? Can we actually get 500 megawatts of FFR in the total Nordic system? Can we get the FCRD requirements implemented? But what will it cost? What will FFR cost? What's the most socio-economical, efficient way of implementing this? And again, if I mean, if you uh, will have eight nuclear, no wait, you will have six nuclear units in 2020 or 2021, somewhere around there. So if we can deliver, I'm hoping, if you could deliver 10% of that as FFR, that would be great. Because then I'd have essentially my entire portfolio. And then, yes? <laughs> no. We're essentially re relying on the entire market. You need a microphone. Yes. Too. No, not for the camera. The microphone. Yeah. Do you need new players or do you want to keep the same players that you already have? We're a market-based platform. We want everyone that we can get. We've got a set of technical requirements from input to output. I don't care what type of resource you have. Okay. Thanks. As long as you can ensure input to output requirements, some form of ICT security, <coughs> so that somebody else doesn't come in and take over your power plant and deliver something else, <laughs> and that you've got... For FCR, we want a certain endurance. FCRN, we've got one hour full endurance. FCRD, we're at the moment looking between 15 to 30 minutes of endurance. FFR, we're looking to, I think, the latest in uh, Stutnet's pilot that they ran, they had a rise time not to 100% within two seconds, endurance 30 seconds, repeatability within 15 minutes. We need a bit harder constraints than that. We're looking at a rise time of one second, plus minus 0.3. If you want to trigger at 49.7, that's a 1.3 uh, seconds rise time. 49.6, one second, 49.5, 0 0.7 seconds rise time, full activation. The first requirement is, is essentially just a pure heavy side step, but you can deliver it linearly if you want. And then there will be some type of uh, requirement on the overshoot as well that you can't have more than 20% overshoot or I don't think we've developed that yet but there will be some form of overshoot requirement um, w the latest I heard was that it's not a 30 second re endurance requirement it's rather down towards 10 second endurance requirement still repeatable within 15 minutes but 2 to 500 megawatts depending on the system state during the year and in, in its current state, most of the requirements are for hydro. Is the for news... F for FFR. No, for FCR. Yeah. Yeah. FCR was developed Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just asking if hydro. the new ones... We're making their technology neutral, but okay. we need to ensure that the current market players can actually deliver so that we have a sustainable future or a sustainable transition period. Because if we implement new requirements and say that from tomorrow hydro can't deliver, then we don't have anything and then we don't have a power system. Thanks. Other questions? 
I'm essentially done. I'm trying to grasp the urgency <laughs> here um, because you're referring to the system development plan yes. that is assuming that nuclear power will decrease after 2025 already. Um, I mean, in addition uh, yeah, to yeah, yeah, ring out yeah, unit yeah, one yeah, and two, yeah, whereas yeah. the plans from the industry is to operate to the 40s. Further, yep. So, and I think we both of us agree that in January 2021, we will not have this solution there yet. We will need a transition so period where we implement new requirements stepwise. Yeah, so how urgent is it? Do we, I mean... We see that uh, there's one reason that we implemented the limitation of Oskarshan 3 last summer. That's the remedial action. That will be in effect until we have FFR or and new FCRD requirements in place. That's not our primary... Oh, limitation of Oskarshan 3 is not our primary focus. That's not what we want to use as a primary means of stabilizing the system. But we need to have uh, actions in all system states as well. And for Oskarshan 3, the, the limitation of the power output for Oskarshan 3 is seen as a preventative remedial action for not being in alert state to keep the system in normal state. Uh, but when you look at all the, if you look at the frequency and the, you look at voltage and you look at power ranges and so on, you need to have remedial actions in all system states anyhow. But we need to focus now on keeping the, the normal state, the normal basis in uh, being so robust and uh, spreading the risk so we can make sure that more actors can contribute to make sure that we will keep the system in normal state as well. Yes. Jonas. Jonas. Thank you, Jonas Persson from Vattenfall. Thank you, Andreas. Very interesting. Why have you selected a triggering frequency at 49.7? Uh, I mean, in the <laughs> national grid, they have enhanced frequency response, and it's almost turned on all the time. Why have you decided to only have it when you have very little inertia and you have a very low frequency? Little inertia is because we only need it during little inertia. So that's the simple one. Um, the I, what level is it at national grid? Forty nine point nine something. That's when we trigger FCRD. Mm -hmm. uh, and essentially, we see FFR as a complement to FCRD. FCRD is still the main main primary resource for transient stability. FFR is a complement. Thereby, we don't see a need for actually triggering it as soon as FFCRD is tra uh, triggered. Also, uh, if we have faults that aren't, isn't the largest nuclear unit or one of the large nuclear units that is tripped, uh, it's an HVDC cable, cable, 600 megawatts, 700 megawatts that is tripped in import mode, um, then the frequency might not drop below 49.6. Then we, don't, we know that it's going to stabilize above 49.5. Then we see that there might not be a reason actually to trigger FFR. Mm -hmm. FFR is there to prevent it from going below 49.0. Uh, I had an initial thought that we might even be able to trigger it down at 49.3, 49.4 somewhere. I below 49, the below the 49.5 level. But our analysis has sh have shown that if you want to trigger it below 49.5, then you would essentially need a momentary response, and that's not possible. Okay, and you don't believe that it can also uh, improve the frequency quality if it would be turned on always? Have you done such studies? The since it's a non-linear, uh, it's a non-linear uh, controller. It only goes on; it doesn't go off, or it g it's a bang-bang controller. But it goes on much faster. Yes, but that doesn't mean that the. Small single stability. It doesn't help that. And it, only, it only helps with the transient phase. Okay, and that, have you shown that in studies? If you have bang-bang control on-off, that won't help. We haven't shown, shown it. That's just our own mental model of it and the own knowledge of it. When you don't have a linear controller, that if you have a bang-bang controller, that won't really help with this unless you have really, really fast, small steps. 
okay. which essentially is almost a linear controller. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know, oh, Elin. Elin Dahlborg from Uppsala University. I'm doing my PhD in FCRD in hydropower. Uh, like you said, having a bang-bang controller is not good for small signal stability. But how about just having synthetic energy that is a linear controller working on the derivative would help in the transient and the small signal stability case? Yes, it would. Why not use that instead of FFR? Because our initial analysis showed that um, the, we developed a report called the Inertia 2, the Future System Inertia Phase 2, in that we modeled a synthetic inertia, which I believe was proportional to the frequency derivative. What we saw was that to stabilize the system frequency, if we wanted to raise that minimum point by 0.1 hertz, you could have various means of doing that. Essentially, you've got all of these three. You can either add new types of resources, you can limit the disturbance, the Oskarshan 3 case, or you can add inertia, synthetic, mechanical, whatever. To raise the system inertia, uh, to raise the minimum frequency by 0.1 hertz, we saw that you needed to limit the dimensioning fault by approximately 120 gigawatts or 120 megawatts you would need a new resource, FFR, or something similar. You could even add more FCRD. You could add, you could strengthen the total system gain. But adding more megawatt per hertz in FCRD also means that it's more difficult to fulfill closed loop stability. So that kind of option grew away from us. But we also said, how much inertia do we actually need to do that? And we saw that to raise that minimum level, you would need to synchronize 20 gigawatt seconds. That's roughly a one and a half Oskarsham 3. It's 4,000 MVAs of hydropower, or if it's 5,000 MVA. It would mean a lot of synchronized inertia in our reports. So we saw that that's not the prime, uh, according to that study, that's not the primary assumption. That's not the easiest way. Because synchronizing 4,000 MVA of hydropower, letting them run on, say, 10% minimum load, that would mean another 400, 500 megawatts of active power in the Nordic system when the system is during its lightest period, during 2, 3, 4 a.m. in the morning for the operators in the control center, they would then have to balance that out somehow in the mid-morning, and that would be difficult. But yes, inertia can help. Thank you, because I read that report yesterday. Yeah. Ah. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we have a counterpoint. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but because I, I was wondering how you actually got that number. There was mm. roughly 300 megawatts that would be needed from synthetic inertia. But so then you actually calculated that if we need 20 gigawatts of inertia, we would need roughly a third of a power, like a nuclear reactor. Yeah, that's the power uh, boost from the inertia. But if you go, I was, oh, Mina? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we can talk uh, over yeah, lunch. Yeah. I would love to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we can probably set up a meeting at SVK and we can discuss it. But I think it was something like that. Yes, we saw that you need 20, 20 gigawatt seconds of inertia. Um, and calculating it backwards to understand the power level, we might have come to 300 gigawatt seconds, and time's almost up. Uh, and that's essentially combined from what is a usual frequency derivative. That's, I wasn't in the project, but that's how I guess it was deducted. So, just last point, again. Ah. For you s Swedish participants, if you want to be in the feasibility study, send an email there, and then we'll go out with formal invitations later on. Uh, feasibility study, then we're moving towards implementation. And then, in the long run, asset management of all of these requirements. 
Thank you very much, Andreas. <laughs>